back. This is Boomer Life on CL 650. Wake me up before you go, go. Believe me, hey, you don't like the yo-yo. Wake me up before you go, go. I don't want to miss it when you hear that. Is that the first time Wham! is being played on CL, do you think? Could be. Could be. <laughs> uh, welcome back to the show. This is Boomer Life. I'm Zach Spencer, and joining me is the snore dentist, Dr. Charnel Muir, uh, located in North Vancouver. Welcome back. Uh, you've been on a few times now. I find it fascinating, this subject, because it affects so many people. Uh, the numbers we're going to get to in a moment. Um, you described before the break the device, the oral device you put in your mouth. Um, I've never put one in my mouth, so I can't imagine. Can you describe it and the comfort or lack thereof? I, I'm, I'm guessing there's some people listening to thinking, I don't know, would that feel weird in your mouth? So describe what your patients go through and, and their reaction to that question. Well, it is actually, I get asked a lot, like, will I even be able to wear it? Mm-hmm. Um, because they are custom made. So it is a commitment once we get one made. It's it, like a it's prescription, only, Yeah, right? it's only made to fit you. But we find, on average, most patients sleep through the night with their oral appliance in the first one to three nights. Most people are expecting weeks when I say that, but mm-hmm. I, it's nights. Mm. And we actually ask them to just spend the first week getting used to it. Now, for some patients, they'll think they're going to gag on it. Or because they have a gag reflex, which is very common in snores and sleep apnics to, to have a gag reflex. Because that's part of the... That's part of that defense mechanism yeah. of, you know, they've spent all night protecting this airway and now, you know, their hu- poor hygienist is going to stick an x-ray in their mouth. And, you know, they uh, the sleep apneic will go first thing in the morning for their dental appointment because they just want to get it over with. It's probably the worst time of the day to go because mm. you're still on fire from protecting the airway. Mm. But... What we find is that because the appliance has a benefit to the airway of holding the jaw forward, which holds the base of the tongue forward because it's attached, it comes along for the ride, that there is no gagging. And last year in the hundreds of patients I treated, I remembered only one patient that had a slight gag reflex when they put their appliance in. So what we did was we actually immediately adjusted it one more millimeter forward and they were fine. So actually, I would think the opposite. You'd take it back a little bit. Yeah. No, just moving yeah, forward. And then other questions people will ask me is, am I going to get a, st- a sore jaw or a stiff jaw? Mm-hmm. And people will um, occasionally, they'll get a sore jaw in the morning. I see it in about only about three out of every hundred patients. Um, and it usually happens if they're grinding and clenching at night. So they're exercising all night long and they get up and they take their appliance out and their jaw feels like they've, you know, had a workout all night. And it usually resolves on its own within seven to 10 days, like any sore muscle from the gym. But they're quite comfortable. It is surprising to a number of patients that they're comfortable, but they're also custom fit. Many of them can be made extremely thin. Uh, They're not like your big hockey football mouth guard where you clamp together with two little holes to breathe through in between your teeth. Um, I think that's the image a lot of people have are these... A big Big mouth mouth. guard thing. No, you can open and close your mouth. You can talk because you know your bed partner is going to ask you a question (laughs) as soon as you stick it in your mouth, right? Um, So you can talk, you can drink water, um, you can yawn. Some of them, if you yawn, you might maybe pop half of it off, but it'll close up once you close up from the yawn. Um, You just wear them if you get up and go to the bathroom. They're easy to, to put up with that type of thing. And so with the device holding your jaw forward a little bit, and taking maybe one or two nights to get used to, I would suspect that this is a device that people will commit to yes. uh, if they're seeing results. Yeah, and, and that's what we find is that people do feel that there's an effect within that first week, and that is a huge driving factor for continuing, especially if they can get a good resolution of some of the snoring in that first week well, their spouse is really going to want them to continue to wear it, right? So you you mentioned that um, you hope that the device, you can sleep through the night after one to three nights. Nights. Well, that's, um, maybe they haven't really had a good night's sleep for many years. Mm -hmm. So that would be a real, pardon the pun, eye-opener. Eye-opener, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I get emails from patients within that first week of, oh my, I had no idea 
how good I could feel. I thought I was normal. I thought I was a normal tired. I thought this is what everybody felt I'm like. I'm just getting older. I'm tired. Yeah, I'm not- all the excuses, right? And now they're starting to feel better. Um, I do actually have to caution some patients because they'll now start to take on too much. And now they become normal tired. You're right. Right. So now, you know, they'll come back at their one year follow up and I'll say, how are you doing? And you're like, wow, I'm getting tired again. And I'm like, oh, so tell me about your day. Oh, well, I'm the president of the PTA and Johnny's on the rap hockey team and and on and on and on and on. And I'm like, okay, well, now you're just normal tired, Mm -hmm. you know, so you got to cut that out. Be nice to yourself. But a lot of people fatigue tiredness, how you feel during the day. It's almost like that frog in the water, right? You don't realize that it's getting hotter and hotter and close to a boil. And you don't realize how tired you are until you stop feeling tired. Okay, well, let's go through the study. Uh, We touched on it the last time you were here, but I think it's worthwhile uh, throwing out some of these numbers about, uh, uh, well, what's the study called? First of all, it's got a funny name or a fun name. It's got a fun name. So it's the Spousal Support Snorings. Snorri's survey. So it was a survey that was done, a fairly large group. Uh, It was done in the States, of course, because that's uh, where a lot of our research comes from. It was published in 2015. Um, And it really tells us a number of things about the effect of snoring on quality of life of the people that you're sleeping with. And one of the things that, you know, we know that about 50% of the population snore. And we know about 30% snore habitually. So if 50% snore occasionally and 30% snore habitually, we actually did find that in the study. 83% of the patients that responded to the study said they'd had at least one bed partner that snored in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So we do come across it. It's a high rate. I would suspect most people listening to this would totally concur. Yeah. I mean, we all know people in our family that snore. That's right. Yeah, you're either the snorer you sleep with a snorer. You have a family member that's a snorer. Uh, uh, someone out there is snoring. And I can it's remember you. Uh, my aunt and uncle at a, a cottage in Ontario, and it was an old cottage, and there wasn't much between the rooms. And I could hear my uncle snoring, you know, three rooms over. Might have been your aunt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So that's, you know, that's what we all remember is, you know, sitting outside of grandpa's room and, and listening to the snoring. And it was, you know, that old saying, oh, he could snore so loud, the paint would come off the walls mm-hmm. or it would rattle the rafters and that type of thing. So snoring can be really loud and really disruptive. We actually measure in decibels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh So what other uh, parts of the study do you have there? Some of the things that we found was that 35% did say that the snoring was so disruptive they weren't able to sleep. And and that's really disruptive to both partners now. So now you've got someone who who can't get to sleep because they're snoring and you've got someone snoring who's probably not sleeping very well. 21% of the people actually got up and left the room or wish they could. And, you know, if, you know, as we said last month, if you're in a one-bedroom apartment... Where do you go? Mm-hmm. You're stuck with the lazy boy recliner or the couch or the lawn chair outside or, you know, something like that. So you're not going to get the best sleep anyway. Um, and then on top of that, 26% were just downright angry. Like they were mad. This person is causing them to lose sleep and lack of sleep can cause some pretty angry people. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, if the, someone's not getting a good night's sleep because they maybe have sleep apnea and then the partner's not getting any sleep because of the snoring, there's a lot that's of discord a double in that whammy. House. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of anger in that house, right? And it can be, it affects relationships. You know, the study said that 15% said that they had made a decision in a romantic relationship and snoring played a role in that. So that's one out of 10 patients say snoring hurt an intimate romantic relationship that they had. Well, could you imagine um, couples starting out dating and become intimate and then they find out that one of them snores, snores. really loudly yeah. and they're like, well, out of here. Yeah, or they, you know, they they just, they weren't willing to do anything about it or as you say, we, we just joked about it. Mm-hmm. You know, they thought it was funny or they're, oh, you're just a light sleeper. You know, I, I'll always hear that, the the patients will come in and say, and I'll say, you know, why are you here? Oh, my wife's a light sleeper. Yeah. You know, yeah. We're speaking with uh, the snore dentist, Dr. Sharnell Muir, based in North Vancouver. 
Now, the people that come to you to get the oral device put in to help them with the snoring, is it just the snoring, the noise, or is it the sleep apnea? What percentage do you think uh, brings people in? So I get patients based on three categories. One is they come in because of the disruptive snoring. And some of them are only snorers and they don't have sleep apnea, but we always test them to make sure because you don't want to treat a snorer unless they've been tested for apnea. That's very, very... So everybody that comes to you has has, the test. Has the test. Okay. Yeah. I, in the guidelines, I would be amiss if I treated someone for just snoring, unless I know it's just snoring, because I can create problems if I treat someone for snoring when we don't even know what their diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. So they might come in with disruptive snoring. They might come in with, I sleep eight hours a night and I'm still dragging my butt through the day and I have terrible fatigue and I don't feel rested, but I don't know why. And then the third person will be someone who either already knows they have sleep apnea or they failed another therapy or they don't want the other therapy or something like that. So those are the three avenues that patients will come to me. And and what are the avenues of finding you? Is it they've heard about it, say, on the radio, um, or if they've been sent by a physician or another sleep professional? Yeah, all of those. So we often will see patients that come in on their own. I'll see patients that come in um, because of word of mouth of other patients. People will find me online with my website or my Facebook. People will listen to this radio show, Mm -hmm. or they'll be sent by their physician because they need the testing. I'll be sent patients for testing. I'll be sent patients who have been previously tested from their physician and they haven't done well on other therapies or don't want it. Or I'll be sent patients from CPAP providers. So they have a patient, they did the testing, they trialed the CPAP, they were intolerant, which can be a higher rate in in some patients. And then they'll be sent to me as a second line therapy. Well, the one thing I want to talk about after the break is um, you have somebody come in and and what it is that you actually do uh, with the testing, because I think that's quite interesting. You know, you send them home with a device or a kit or something that, uh, well, you're going to explain it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I will. Because I haven't had it done yet. Yeah. I I keep telling my wife uh, about uh, these shows and the interview and about yourself and She's quite interested in getting me in. Yes, I have no <laughs> doubt. Yes. About the snoring, because apparently I snore. I've never heard it myself. Uh, we're speaking with the snore dentist, Dr. Charnel Muir. I have to tell you, this is the most brilliant marketing, the snore dentist. Uh, the snore Because it's so simple to yeah. remember. Uh, you must have people that say, I just know, I just heard snore dentist and I remember who you are. Yeah, and it's easy to find because my website is that as well, right? Snoredentist.ca. So if you just type in snore dentist, you're bound to find me somehow. All right, and you're in North Vancouver. Yes. We'll find out about um, what you do to find out about what level you are of a snore when we come back. Speaking with the snore dentist on CL 650. Celebrating the Boomer lifestyle. This is Boomer Life on CL 650.